Now we're going into a most important time in this service when we open the eternal word of God and God has a word for us today and I want you to turn in your Bibles if you have one there with you. If not, this will also be on the screen. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse number 4. We're going to look at this fourth verse today out of this most marvelous chapter and I want us to pray because we know that according to scripture that the time when the word of God is preached and taught is a time of warfare. Did you know that? Did you know that Jesus said at this time that, and I'm paraphrasing here, but at this time as we're going to throw the seed out, we're going to cast the seed out, we're going to sow the word of God, Jesus seemed to indicate that there was an increased level of spiritual warfare because the enemy doesn't want you to get this. He wants to rob you of the precious seed of the word of God. So today, let's pray before we read this. Our Father, we humble our hearts before you this day. We set our hearts to tremble at your word. We know that your word is eternal. It's a spirit-given book. You breathed this book out. You gave it to men exactly what you wanted them to have and what you wanted us to have. Father, I pray for your presence. We so desperately need the anointing. Anoint every mind and heart in this place. Anoint this your speaker. And Father, I pray that we would hear and listen as you've said. And we receive everything that you have for our church today. And we ask your blessing on it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm going to focus on this fourth verse in this great chapter. You know, this is one of the great chapters of the Bible. Some have called it the great hall of faith. We have some great men and women of God in this chapter that have done great things. And we're going to learn about one of these things, one of these persons today. In fact, his life came to a very tragic end. He didn't live a long time. He wasn't an old man. He didn't get to live out his days. In fact, he's the very first martyr He's the very first one. He is the fourth human being to be born on this planet. And we know that he was a man of faith because he's commended to us here. His name is Abel. So we're going to learn about Abel today. And we're going to learn about faith. I've titled this message, Abel the Worshipper, the Power of Faith. I really should have titled it, The Worship of Faith. You know, Enoch next week walked with God the walk of faith. But here we have the worship of faith. Look at this verse on the screen. One verse. For by faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. Now it's interesting. Let me stop here. Look at me for a moment. As you read the Bible, and, and I encourage you to be a Bible reader, there's nothing more enriching. There's nothing that you can do more for your walk with God than to read the Bible every single day. Not as a law, not as some kind of rote routine that you go through, but we meet God on the pages of his word. And as we look in the word of God, we see this man named Cain. And the Bible said that when, when Eve had Cain, she said, I've received a man from the Lord. Now we know after the fall what happened is the Lord gave a promise that one would come who would bruise, his heel would be bruised, but he would crush the serpent's head. And certainly Eve thought Cain was the redeemer. She thought this is the one that's going to redeem us. I've received a man from the Lord, but he wasn't the redeemer. He was of the enemy. He was a murderer. The first murderer, Cain. Today we're going to talk about his religion. We're going to talk about Abel's faith, but we also have to include in that Cain's faith, or lack thereof. So look at it. By faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and through it, he being dead, yet speaks or still speaks. After all these thousands of years, this man, Abel, and his name really means breath or brevity, and he lived a very brief life. And can I tell you this? 
Sometimes it's veiled from us. We think death is always going to happen to someone else. But I want to tell you today, though it may be uncomfortable for us, is this. If Jesus tarries for his people, every single one of us are going to, are going to have an appointment. And we will keep that appointment. It's appointed a man wants to die. And then the judgment. We're all going to die one day. But for the child of God, it's very different. I can't even wrap my mind around someone who dies without Jesus Christ. It pains me to think of this gentleman who hung himself recently. And you know all the story that's been plastered over the news. But my, my thought is that maybe he cried out to God. Maybe he did. I don't know. I know that as wicked as that man was, if he would have cried out to God, the Lord would have saved him. That's how, that's how merciful God is. But what we see here is this story about Abel and his, and his worship. You can peruse over your headlines today. Just open your web browser to your news feed or open a paper. And you, 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 we're constantly seeing people. Sometimes they're younger. Sometimes they're older. Sometimes they're in the entertainment industry. Sometimes they're in the business industry. But we see constantly those whom the world touts as this person is great. And that's the estimation of the world. But I remind you of this verse in the book of Luke 16, 15. Out of the NLT it says in the last part of that, what the world honors is detestable to God. What the world, what the world says is great is not great in the sight of God. It's not really great. It's, it's an illusion of great. But it's, it's vainglory, if you will. But as we look at this great chapter, and we're really just step, getting our toes wet into it, aren't we? As we look at Hebrews chapter 11, what we see is who the, wor- who the Lord rather calls great. These people in this chapter are the ones that God is saying to us as his New Testament church, do you want to see what greatness is? Do you want to see what pleases me? Do you want to know how to live? Do you want to know what my estimation is of greatness? I want you to look at this chapter, he says, in a sense. And today we're looking at this man by the name of Abel. And the fact, the key key to greatness in, in the sight of God is faith. Now think about this. Look at me. Think about this. In our world, people that are great have great power. They have great prestige. They have everything the world has to offer. But do you realize that James says this, the poor, the poor are rich. How could God say they're rich? Because his value system is completely opposite of what we deem as great and grand and wonderful. The the poor, it says in James, are rich. They're rich in faith. And what God deems as great is faith. What God deems as great is faith. So what is faith? How does the Bible define it? How does the Bible define it? illustrate it and describe it. We have it in this chapter in many facets. We have Moses, we have Abraham, we have Joshua, we have Sarah, we have Rahab, all these people who live by genuine faith. But what we know is that the scriptures are put together. We understand when they came through the Holy Spirit to the apostles, they didn't have John 3, 16 or Romans 5 and 5 or Romans. There was no verses. There were no chapters that was given many, many years later. But what we had is Scripture. That's it. The Scriptures. So there wasn't a chapter break from chapter 10 to chapter 11. It was all flowed together. It would be a very, very beneficial exercise to you to every once in a while get a Bible that has no chapter and verses and just read it. It'd be, you'd be amazed at how it opens it up. You can buy them without chapter, without verse. That's how it came to us. And I'm grateful for chapter and verse, by the way. But notice this, faith, genuine faith, is not momentary belief. Genuine faith is not, it's not empty confession. You know, it's like the, it's like the young man who was at youth camp. I heard of this recently. The young man, a young, a group was at youth camp. The youth pastor took him to youth camp and then 
the, the speaker spoke very eloquently, very passionately, gave the altar call very passionately, very movingly, if you will, and, and, and gave the gospel. But the youth pastor listening to it realized that the speaker did not really clearly articulate the gospel. So when the kids went, one of the young men in particular went down and he prayed, and then as they got back to their dorm, the, the youth minister felt he needed to speak with this young man that, to see if he understood what he did even. So he's talking to the young man. He said, well, I saw you went down. And he basically said, you know, I want to make sure that you understand. So he began to share the gospel with him. And he began to say, you know, this is the gospel. The gospel is the power of God to salvation. The gospel is that we believe upon the Lord. We surrender our lives to him. We do like the Thessalonians. We turn from, to, you know, to God from idols. We need to repent. The Bible taught, he talked to him a little about repentance. And after he explained very clearly the gospel, the young man looked at him and said, I don't know about all that. And when I heard that story, I thought, we are there in many, many lives, maybe millions of lives today, because they've never heard, clearly heard, what the gospel demands are. And when they hear what the gospel and what Jesus Christ really demands, I'm, I'm afraid that people may stand up and say, you know, I, I, I don't want to go to hell, but I don't know about all that other stuff. So what we have to do is clearly understand what faith really, really is. And what faith is, is is unwavering faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Right before chapter 11 that we're teaching out of, you've got chapter 10. Listen what the end of chapter 10 says, and I'll read it to you. Verse 35, it says, Therefore do not cast away your confidence, for it has great reward, For you need endurance, not momentary belief, not once and done, not go down in empty confession, not go down in, yeah, I don't want to go to hell, but I really don't want the gospel. I don't want the commands of God. I don't want to follow God. I just don't want to go to hell. That's not the gospel. That's not saving faith. It's an enduring faith. So that after you have done the will of God, that's part of faith that you may receive the promise for yet a little while. He who is coming will come, will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith, but if anyone draw back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who draw back to perdition. Hear that? We are not of those who draw back to perdition, but of those who believe. Believe and keep believing. It's the verb. We believe. We keep believing. We keep trusting. We keep following. Like Enoch, he walked with God. Someone who has faith in Jesus Christ walks with him and has a new life in him to what? Here's where it's going to end, the saving of the soul. And then we come to chapter 11, don't we? Now look, now look at this. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. What is a Christian? A Christian is someone who lives by unseen realities. That's not an oxymoron. Unseen realities. Faith is never defined in Scripture as blind faith. Faith in Scripture is founded on the unchanging unchanging Word of God. Hebrews 11 represents those people who lived by a very clear directive promise from God. They lived in the reality of what God had said. God spoke to Enoch. God spoke to Noah. God spoke to Abraham. God spoke to Sarah, spoke to Moses, spoke to Joshua. These are, not, these are not some empty fantasy. This is very clear direction from the Lord God Almighty. What am I saying? Our faith, genuine faith, is substantive. It's reality. We're not living by some kind of imaginary spiritual fantasy. We have substantive. Why? Our God's real. I watched a little video yesterday of a Buddhist monk who was becoming a monk, and he had to repeat all the mantras and all this and that. That's empty nothingness. We have a God who's real. Verse 6 of this chapter says that we believe that God is and that he is the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. We don't possess the full reality, but we do possess the, 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 uh, the earnest of it. We possess it. How do we possess that? We possess it through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, it says in Ephesians, you who first trusted in Christ, that you should be to the praise of his glory. Verse 13, in him, 
you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, whom you have having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit. Verse 14, who is the guarantee of our inheritance unto the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. The truth is, those who are without God are the ones living in a false reality. I read this week where, and you might have seen this, where Google has set the algorithms, proven fact, one of, one of the, the big-time engineers that was working for Google defected, took a bunch of secret documents, gave them to a major news source, making, making big money for Google. But here's what he said, I quote. He said, I was making big money with Google. He said, but my conscience ate at me so bad, he said, I could not live with myself if I did not tell the, the American people what's happening. And, and basically, we knew what they're doing. They're setting the algorithms of their search engines so they get, it, they get the desired results. So in other words, when you search for something, they're controlling what you're getting. They're controlling the political view you're getting. They're controlling the religious view you're getting. And they're trying to create a, a, a social mindset. It's happening right now. Well, I thought, that's what the devil does. The devil gets people in a false reality. People think what's real is not really real. What is real are the unseen realities that are revealed to the, by the Word of God. We can see eternity. We can see who God is. We can see reality. How? We see it through the truth of the Word of the living God. Satan blinds mind. He distorts minds. The only reliable reality is the truth found in the Word of God. How do we understand origins? How do we understand human purpose? Where are we, where are we headed in the future? Where is true happiness found? The answer is found in the Word of God and in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Come on. Jesus Christ is the answer. And it's this kind of faith that receives our, the commendation from the Lord. It's this kind of faith that gives us a proper view on the world. It says in the verse 2 and 3 of that Hebrews 11, they obtained a testimony. The elders did. We understand the worlds were framed by the word of God. And then we come to the first listed individual. He listed elders as a broad synonym. And then he lists a man who is the very first one that we should be encouraged, and we call it the worship of faith. Abel is a worshiper. I want us to look at this story. What a dramatic story it is. The story of Cain and Abel are the first two young men to be born, and they're first to be born after the fall. Cain the older, Abel the younger. And what we see in these two men li men's lives, we see the contrast between genuine faith and, we and false faith. One makes you righteous and grants you righteousness. The other leaves you in sin. So today we want to look at this story. And we get some, we get some questions answered. One of the questions we get is, how do we really worship God? How do we gain righteousness, which is our greatest need? And very important, how do I prepare for eternity? Because it's staring us all in our face. Abel. The worshiper. First thing I want you to notice, I want you to notice Abel's approach to God. And I'll read a little bit out of Genesis 4, verse 1. And, a and Adam knew his wife Eve, and she conceived and bore Cain and said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. She thinks he's the promised one. But how disappointed she was to watch her sons grow up and watch her second son become a martyr, and her first son is a murderer. The Bible calls Cain evil, from the evil one. Then she bore again, and, and uh, at this time, uh, uh, this time, his brother Abel. And notice, Abel was a keeper of the sheep. Cain was a tiller of the ground. In the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. And Abel also brought of the firstborn of the flock and of the fat. Notice, and the Lord respected Abel's, Abel and his offering. But he did not respect Cain and his offering. Cain was very angry. His countenance fell. 
So that the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? And why has your countenance fallen? Maybe another time I'll go back into the depths of the story. But if I had a nickel for every time someone said, well, you know, this is the way I worship God, I would be a rich man today, which I'm not, which probably doesn't surprise you. Oh, but if I had a nickel, Brother Frank, for every time somebody, well, you know, I know that's what, but this is the way I worship God. Let me be clear on this. There is no such thing as the way you worship or the way they worship or this. There's only one way of worship. It's prescribed in the Bible. Everything else is wrong and false. And here's two men. Two men come to the place of worship. There is a place of worship here. One brings a certain offering. The other brings another offering. See, the Bible is a book of worship. And it shows us clearly how we are to approach God. Man is a worshiper. Man's going to worship something. And notice that these men, notice, we, we only think of Abel as a worshiper. No, no, my friend, Cain was also a worshiper. He also came to the place of worship, probably right outside the Garden of Eden. They came to this place of worship. But I want you to notice with me how vastly different their approaches are. In our modern day, we often hear this. You know, it really doesn't matter how you worship. As long as you're sincere, that's completely false. Millions sincerely worship idols. Many worship animus gods. Many worship false in false ways. Many are in new age deception. There's only one way to worship. And Jesus Christ, our Lord, said the hour is coming when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. And the Father seeks us to worship Him in spirit and truth. See, true worship is more than an outward act, but it has very much to do with the heart, as we shall see here. I can imagine that as Abel approached God, he approached God in genuine faith. He came to this place of worship, but yet one was completely rejected and one was accepted. So notice that. Their approaches were different. Abel's approach was right. Secondly, quickly, notice Abel's atonement. He approached God with a sacrifice. We know it was a blood sacrifice. Was it just the fruit of the ground? And I'm not, no, I know the text doesn't make a huge difference. I really think more than anything... It was the way they came. With the, one came with faith. One came and didn't have faith. But yet we, we do have to recognize here there is a blood sacrifice here, which of course points to the New Testament. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. Only by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. We know those prophecies point all the way to the cross of Christ. The most important event with, of course, its subsequent resurrection. But notice what it says in verse 4. Abel also brought of the firstborn of the flock and of the fat. Notice the Lord respected Abel and his offering. Now, I just can imagine. I want you to picture in your mind. Here are these two young men, and they're coming to the place of worship. Now, I can imagine that here comes Abel, and he has the very best for God. You know, Brother Bob mentioned God's very best, having the very best. He comes with the very best. He comes with something costly. There is sacrifice involved in this. There is life and death involved in this. And I can imagine that Abel, here he is. Can you see him in your mind's eye? He's approaching the place of the altar. He's coming to worship God. There's a deep humility in Abel. His attitude's completely different than Cain. His, he has a heart of humility. There's a brokenness. I can even imagine him bringing this animal. And he's, his tears are probably beginning to flow down. As the Spirit of God is working in his life, he realizes he's approaching holy God. He realizes he's unworthy and deserves nothing before God. But God has prescribed the way that we can worship him and walk with him and have fellowship with him. And I can see Abel coming with deep brokenness, deep humility, full of faith. 
what we see in Abel is genuine faith. Submission. It's not outward road. It's not just being there. But something's happening in him. He's willing. He's there worshiping. He's there willing to do anything God wants him to do. He's willing to obey God. He's willing to submit to God. His heart is so full of faith and submission that God says, I respected his offering because of the way that it was given. I'm going to tell you this. Genuine faith is always defined as obedient faith. From Genesis all the way to the end of the book, we read in Romans, who, through, through him we have received grace and apostleship, notice, for obedience to the faith. At the end of Romans, chapter 16, verse 26, but now manifest by the prophetic scriptures, he made known to all nations according to the commandment of the everlasting God for the obedience of faith. Hear this, listen closely. Cain's attitude and his atonement was all wrong. He came, he possessed no repentance, no humility. There was no desire to obey God, no desire to really worship God or submit to God. And I can tell you this, the Word of God offers no assurance to anyone. No, listen, no matter, how many, no matter how many correct words they they may have the correct words. They may even spout the correct doctrine, but the Word of God offers no assurance to those who claim to have a faith who are maintaining a rebellious heart toward God and His commands. That is not genuine faith. Genuine faith always breaks us before God. Genuine faith helps us to acknowledge what we truly are. Genuine faith always brings us to the place of willingness to say, Jesus Christ is Lord. But false faith always leaves us as a rebel. You know what it is? Cain religion. But true faith leads us away from sin and into a transformed heart. Verse 4 again, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous. This is what God said of him. God said Abel was righteous. Now let's do a little background. Here's what happened. The fall happened in Genesis chapter 3. Man separated from holy God and brought sin into humanity. The Lord came and met with them after the fall and gave them a promise, Genesis 3.15. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. And then the Lord himself shed blood. You say, the Lord shed blood? The Lord shed blood. It's, it's not there explicitly, but it's implicitly there. It's there Genesis 3.21. Would you look at it closely? Also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin. And he clothed them. Blood was shed. He clothed them. The tunics were from a slain animal. Now, what I believe with all my heart, Cain and Abel, from the lips of Adam and Eve, knew the story. They knew the tragedy. They knew what had happened. They knew the fall. They knew what was on the other side of the fall before the fellowship, walking with God in the cool of the evening, a place of perfection. There was no sin. There was no sorrow. There was, there was no turmoil. There was complete unity with God. But look what's happened now. Now, instead of being totally God conscious, we're self conscious. We're broken. But listen, God has showed us it's not hopeless. Boys, Cain, Abel, listen, it's not hopeless. You can still have fellowship with God. You can still walk with God. It's not hopeless for you. But there's only one way. This is the way to approach God. This is the way sin can be atoned for. See, because what we're doing is we're looking back to the cross. They were looking toward the cross. The same faith they needed is the same faith I needed. I wasn't in Jerusalem when Jesus died, but I have faith to believe that it is, it is true. These boys knew. Cain knew how to worship God. Abel knew how to worship God. Abel said yes. Cain said no, I'll do it my own way. I don't believe it. Mm -hmm. 
Now look at this. See, the truth is, Cain's atonement was wrong. But Abel, listen, Abel's atonement was correct. Are you hearing me today? Abel's atonement was correct. And our, listen, our atonement is correct. Because if it's the atonement found in Romans 3, 21 through 26, where it talks about Jesus being our propitiation, we got it right because it comes out of this book right here. Ours is right. Come on, if you have Jesus, that's the right atonement. If you have believed that Jesus is the God-man, come 2,000 years ago, lived a perfect life, died at 33, was buried and rose on the third day, you've got the right atonement. Why? Because there is no other name given among men whereby we must be saved but at the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. His, the angel said, His name shall be called Jesus, and He shall save His people from their sin. This is what Abel believed in. In seed form, yes. Did he understand as we understand today? No. But what God gave him, he believed and he acted on. It was Abel's worship. It was genuine faith. Now notice this quickly. Abel's actions. His actions demonstrate that he had genuine faith. The Bible says, I've, I've referenced it, Abel was righteous. This is what God said. He was righteous. Genuine faith will always grant the believing sinner both judicial righteousness and sanctifying righteousness. Now listen. Genuine faith will always offer the believing sinner both declared and judicial righteousness and sanctifying righteousness, practical righteousness. We see it all through the Bible. We see both of them mentioned throughout, even in Romans 1, 16, 17. For therein the gospel is the power, righteousness of God by faith. The righteousness of God is revealed. But Romans 6 goes with it too, right? So is there, is, do we have this, and this concerns me when I hear gospel preaching, this justifying righteousness is so far removed from sanctifying righteousness that the twain shall meet. And it's almost as if we have parsed out the gospel to almost believe falsely that somehow, only way we're, you know, well, yeah, when we get to heaven, no, God tells us to strive for this now through the help of his Holy Spirit. Romans 6 and 1 says, Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? And what did Paul say? Did Paul say, Oh, yeah. Yeah, you've got judicial righteousness. Ah, don't worry about all that sin stuff. Don't worry about holy living. No, that's not what he said. Get you a Greek lexicon. Begin to study these words. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Paul is saying in a sense, do you think that's the gospel that Jesus gave us? God forbid, he says. How can we live in sin who've been freed from it and delivered from it and washed from it? You've been baptized into Jesus so that you can raise out of that tomb and live a brand new life by the power of the Holy Spirit. What a difference in Cain and Abel. What a difference. What is the place of works in our lives? Well, the truth is, doctrinally, obedience demonstrates the reality of our faith. We are not saved by works, but works will follow genuine faith in the believer's life. Ephesians 2.10, for we are his workmanship. That's judicial righteousness. He worked our righteousness. He declared our righteousness. He granted our righteousness. But is that it? Oh, no. Notice this. Created in Christ Jesus for good works. Judicial sanctifying, which God prepared before that we should walk in them. James 2, 17, thus also faith by itself, if it, is, if it does not have works, is it's dead. It's not real faith. So think about it. Righteousness is always a part of genuine faith, both the judicial 
in both the practical, the sanctifying. Yes, the sanctifying part. Many are on different levels. We grow it different ways. Absolutely. But it's not just judicial righteousness. It's also practical righteousness. Because, in, listen, in Hebrews chapter 11, what we have is a demonstration of genuine faith. So let's just look at it. Noah was called a preacher of righteousness. Enoch walked with God, and he declared to those in his day, according to Jude, that they, what they were doing was wicked, and God was going to judge them. Abraham lived a separated life as a pilgrim living in a tent. Moses, it says, forsook the world, choosing not to enjoy the pleasures of sin, but to serve God. Rahab, completely separated from the evil Canaanites, and joined Israel. What does it say of the others? Others were tortured not accepting deliverance. They obtained a better resurrection. Verse 36 of Hebrews 11, still others had trial, cool mockings, scourgings, yes, and change and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were tempted. They were slain with a sword. They wandered in sheepskins and goatskins and destitute and afflicted and tormented, whom the world is, whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth. So if Hebrews 11 describes the lives of those who possess genuine faith, and our, and our faith is completely different than what's described there, is it, is it real faith? I don't think it is. Here's what, just take this with you. Pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no man will see the Lord. That verse is in Hebrews 2, next chapter, right? As we, as we hurry, almost done. Look at Abel's acceptance. The Lord accepted Abel's offering. Now, it doesn't say how he knew that he accepted it. I have my, what I guess, you know what I think it was? Fire. I think it was fire. How did, here's these boys standing here. Abel offers his offering, the, 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 the lamb, the, the slain animal. Cain offers the fruit of his hands, the fruit of the ground. And those boys both knew the Lord accepted one of those offerings. He rejected one of those offerings. How did those gentlemen know? I believe it was fire. Fire. You say, why would you say that when the text doesn't say that? It's only uh, me surmising. But l listen to some other passages in Scripture. Leviticus 9.24. The fire came out from before the Lord and consumed the burnt offering. Judges 6.25 or 21. The angel of the Lord put out the end of his staff that was in his hand, and he touched the meat and the unleavened bread, and fire arose from the rock and consumed the meat and the unleavened bread. 1 Kings 18, 38. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice. 1 Chronicles 21, 26, latter part. By, uh, he says, uh, in, or I'll read the first part. And David built an altar to the Lord and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings and called on the Lord, and, the, and he answered him from heaven by fire on the altar of the burnt offering. 2 Chronicles 1, uh, 7, 1. And Solomon, when he had finished praying, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifice, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. So could it have been, as those boys were there, that when Abel offered his offering, that fire from God came down? And you know what that fire was? Now, I believe that fire symbolized the very judgments of God for our sin that came upon Jesus as he took our sins upon him. And Abel, that was what Abel deserved. And you look at the cross, and it's what we deserved. Do you see the story? I close with this. Abel's assassination. Verse 6 of Genesis 4 and the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? And why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? If you do not do well, sin lies at the door, and its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. And now Cain talked with his brother, his, uh, Abel, his brother, and it came to pass when he was in the field, Cain 
rose up against Abel, his brother, and killed him. Premeditated. I believe with all my heart. He ruminated over this. We don't know how long. Days, weeks, months, years. Who knows? But we know this, this murder got in his heart. And then the Lord said to Cain, where, where is Abel, your brother? And he said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? Look how, look how callous this man is. And he said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now, I don't know what the conversation was that day as those two brothers walked out into the field, but I have to believe that, and I have to assume that it had to do with something related to the worship of God. It had to be related to this this thing that caused so much consternation and so much anger, rebellion in Cain's heart. Because 1 John 3.12 says this, Not as Cain, who was, the, who was of the wicked one, and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because, notice, his works were evil, and his brothers were righteous. Now notice that verse. Why did he murder him? His works were evil, his brothers were righteous. It had something to do with Abel following God. Do you know in our nation today, there is an anger toward Christians, an unnatural anger. If you you simply say, without being mean to anyone else, without saying, you know, not anyone's enemy, not wishing anyone harm, but if you simply say, I believe that marriage is between a man and a woman, you will be the brunt of hostility. It's unnatural because it's demonic. And I just predict, I can't say I prophesy, but I'm I'm about that far from saying I would. If the Lord tarries in the decades ahead, it's going to cost you to follow Jesus Christ. And it will be the best thing that ever happened to our modern church in America. Because it's going to purify the church. And it's going to get out the mushy middle. You know what the mushy middle is in the church? The mushy middle is in the 50s when it was fashionable to go to church. Oh, you know, I'm an insurance salesman. I can get more business, you know, and you got folks joining the church that never even got saved. But in times of persecution, in times when you truly have to take up the cross of Christ, it purifies the church because you have to get in line to lay your life down, if need be. But what happened is I believe they went out into that field this day, just me surmising, not adding And they were talking about the offering. They were talking about what God demanded and wanted. And I would just believe on that day, Abel wouldn't bend. Abel said, no, my brother, I love you, but Jesus is the only way. Not knowing Jesus, of course. You get the picture. Well, I think this. I know, but, but this is what mom and dad told us that God told them. This is the way to worship God. This is the way to fellowship with God. This is the way to be restored. And I believe that's the, that's the conflict in some sense. Abel, the first martyr. Since that time, certainly the blood of the saints has become the seed of the church. Suffering is a part of genuine faith. We hear a lot of talk about the promises of God, but you won't ever, you won't ever hear someone say, oh, I got a great promise from God today. Let me tell you. What about this promise? All who live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Try that one on. I'll close with this. Would our musicians come? I know I preached quite long, but oh, I'm so glad I did. I want you to stand with me. If you would, we'll pray. Thank you for being faithful and Thank you for being attentive today. A little bit longer preaching never hurt a church. Amen? Amen. I close with this thought. Abel has an announcement for us. Do you know Abel is still speaking? Look at back at our text. By faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts. Now, here's, here's, here's his announcement. 
And, and through it, he being dead, he still speaks. He's dead now. Abel's gone. But he still speaks to us. What does he speak? What is his message to us today? First of all, his message is this, that redemption is found in Jesus Christ alone. See, Abel's blood cries out for vengeance, but the blood of Christ calls out for redemption. Jesus spoke about this, and others did. Hebrews 12, 24 speaks about this. Look at this verse. To Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, to the blood of the sprinkling that speaks of better things than that of Abel. It contrasts the blood of Jesus with the blood of Abel. The blood of, the blood of Abel calls for vengeance, but the blood of Jesus shed cries for mercy for you and me. Abel speaks to us about the persecution and reproach of the people of faith. First martyr. First martyr. But I can tell you, he won't be the last. Our days ahead in this planet are going to be very difficult. Millions and millions will die for their faith. More people are dying for Jesus Christ now than have ever died in the history of the earth. But you don't hear about it. But it's happening around the world. And Abel speaks to us about eternal life. Though he's dead, he still speaks. And one of the reasons he speaks is he's not really dead. Dead physically, yes. He's not really dead. He's still speaking because he is in the presence of God. Jesus said it. I'm the resurrection and the life. And he who believes in me, though he die, he shall live. It's the worship of Abel. I think what we should do, I know that we have come to the altar previously. But I think what, what I feel in my heart is the way that Abel came to God he came in genuine faith, sincerity. His worship was real. Why don't we just take a moment here, right where you're standing there, and just take a moment and, and really bring that kind of genuine faith that, Lord, I love you. I worship you. Lord, I'm, I'm flawed, many mistakes, but, Lord, I, I sincerely come to you. Could we just do that? Could you just right there? You know, we don't, we don't tell people how to do that, but just... Just express your sincere love to the Lord today. Father, we're so grateful for, your, for this man, Abel. His story is so moving. Lost his life so early, so young. But yet, he didn't waste his life. And Lord, no life that served has surrendered and serves you is ever a waste, no matter if, it's, if they don't have a lengthy life or not. Lord, it's worth it to serve you. And Lord, we bring our worship, we bring our love to you today. Pray, God, that we would be firm in our faith like Abel, that we would have the worship where we're righteous and truly striving by your help, of course, by your grace, of course, but to be holy and godly and to strive to obey you in all things. And we bring blessing to you. Father, I thank you for this wonderful day. We sense your presence in our prayers and our worship and our sharing together in the word of God. Thank you for the presence of the Lord that you've graced us with this in this place. I would say to you as our heads are bowed that if the Lord is dealing with your heart, if you're not saved, if you do not know Jesus Christ as your Savior, I would love to pray with you at the conclusion of this service. If you once walked close to God and you've drifted away and you'd say, Pastor, I just really need to talk with someone. I need to be restored. I'm struggling. I know I'm saved, but I'm struggling. I'd certainly love to personally pray with you. I'll be up here to pray with you. But if you've never known Christ, if you, are, if you know that if you died today, that you would die lost and go out into eternity without Christ, I'm going to just emphasize, you're in a dangerous place. 
You're in a dangerous place for the sake of Christ and His blood. Do not leave this place without coming and talking to me or one of our leaders that we can lead you to Christ and salvation. We can show you what that is. We care for you. We care for your soul. More than importantly, Jesus died and He cares eternally for us. So Father, today as we conclude this service, I pray that salvation would take place. If there's a need of salvation here, that you would save, that you'd redeem, that you'd restore the backslider, that you'd save that lost person, that maybe they think they can't even be saved. Maybe they feel like they've sinned too greatly, but that's a lie from the enemy because where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. And for this, we thank you today.